Well, I've uh, already read the text this morning, so I'm not going to read it again. But what I'd like to do is just read a summary verse, just one verse from this text to begin. And that is in John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Uh, we're looking this morning at the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. He is the, um, as it were, you know, bread is representative of that which sustains life, of that which allows us to continue to live. Jesus is a kind of bread that if we eat of it will actually sustain us forever. And that's what we need. That's what we need to eat. What we need is Jesus. We need to trust in him. Now again, we've seen in chapter 6, we've seen a few things. We've seen Jesus feeding the 5,000. He fed the 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fish. And this was to show us that he is the prophet, that he is the Messiah, the only one that God has sent to save. Again, that's what Jesus is telling us about in this Bread of Life discourse. He is the source of life. We saw that Jesus sent his disciples across the sea by themselves to face a stormy trial uh, to teach us that spiritual growth, actually becoming stronger in the Lord, comes only through difficulties. I mean, it'd be nice if it came through a bed of roses, but it doesn't. It's not smooth sailing. It's often stormy, but that's what we need. We've also seen that the more we grow in the Lord, the more difficult the trials become. They have to become intense, more intense, so that we continue to grow. And then we also saw that the crowds that were fed by Jesus searched for Jesus until they found him in Capernaum. But again, we're reminded they were looking for him only that they might get more of what Jesus already gave them. More of this physical bread rather than spiritual bread. By which again we were reminded that we need continually to be seeking Jesus. But we need to be seeking him for the right things, not for the things of the world. Which a lot of people do today. We need to be seeking him for spiritual blessings, the things that will make us stronger and more like him that we might do as well. Now this morning Jesus is going to tell us a little bit more about what those right reasons are, what it is we ought to be seeking from him rather than the things of the world. We need to be seeking spiritual bread. Now, I mentioned before that John typically wrote about the things that Jesus said and did that the other gospel writers didn't record. It's almost like he's filling in the gaps. So we've already got, he wrote his gospel last, so we've already got all this information. Well, John's saying, let me tell you about some things Jesus did that aren't recorded in the other Gospels so that you might know who he is. You might know he is the Messiah and that believing you might have life in his name. And yet, we also saw that John recorded the feeding of the 5,000, which is something the other Gospels record. This is the only miracle that all four Gospels actually record. Now, why did John make this exception? It was that he might include what it is that we are now reading that is, the bread of life discourse. Now, when the crowds asked Jesus, when did you get here? When did you arrive in Capernaum? He said to them in verses 26 and 27. He didn't answer their question, but he told them what they needed to hear. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, and again, not because these signs authenticated the fact that I'm sent from God. You didn't come here to learn from me. But because you ate of the loaves and were filled, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, the Father, God has set his seal. Well, when Jesus said this, this prompted them to ask in verse 28, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Now, Jesus answers that question in the remainder of John chapter 6. And in this section, as I've already told you, Jesus tells us two things. How you can be saved. This is the work of God that you believe in His Son whom He sent. You can be saved by feeding on and eating, as it were, the bread of life. The second thing is what the Father has to do before you can come. This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He sent. God must be the one who 
draws you. Eternal life, we, we talk about it being the gift of God. Well, it is absolutely the gift of God. It's not only that he provides it for you so that you may choose, as it were, to receive him or not receive him. He also provides the means by which you might receive him. He overcomes your sinfulness so that you might trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I've said, these are the two things he talks about that our text tells us about. We don't have time to look at both of them this morning. So we're going to look at the first point this morning, how you can be saved by feeding on the bread of life. And we're going to save the second point for this evening. But under the first point, I want us to see three things. First of all, that Jesus is the bread of life. Secondly, that you must eat of this bread if you will live forever. And thirdly, that you have to continue to feed on this bread if you're going to be spiritually strong. Jesus is bread that we need to eat on a daily basis. So first of all, let's consider that Jesus is the bread of life. And of course, what does that mean? Now, Jesus told the crowd that they needed to work for the food that doesn't perish. And they, in return, asks the question, well, what is that work? What is it we need to do? Jesus answered in verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Now again, I just wanted to note, Jesus isn't saying this is a work, the only work that you can do, that God will accept, that you believe in him, as it were, but this is a work that God does in you that enables you to believe in Jesus, and we're going to look at that this evening. Jesus weaves these two themes together, so I don't want to separate them entirely. We do need to see that this is the work of God, not our work by which we are saved. But I do want us to look at the other point this morning that we must believe. Now everything that follows, though it sounds strange and confusing at times, is all about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus pictures faith as eating this bread which his Father supplies out of heaven, as literally eating him. Now that sounds strange, but let me just say, here, just think Spurgeon, if I can put it that way. Because Spurgeon, as you know, is famous for communicating spiritual truths, communicating the gospel through concrete images. Uh, right now we're in a section of Spurgeon's book, Only a Prayer Meeting, where he's drawing spiritual lessons from concrete images. In other places, he takes the scripture and he, as he finds truth there, he tries to think of images by which he can picture those truths. Well, that's exactly what Jesus is doing in our passage. I mean, Spurgeon knew that Jesus was a master at this, and he was simply following Jesus' example of trying to make these abstract truths more concrete. So remember, Jesus here is speaking about faith in concrete images. Jesus says in verses 30 and 31, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Okay, Jesus is saying, this is the work of God that we believe in you. Why should we believe you? What is it you're going to do? Prove it. Do another miracle. Give us more bread to eat. I mean, Moses did that, and he listened to him. He gave them manna in the wilderness. What are you going to do, Jesus, so that we may believe in you? Now, again, Jesus has already done a miracle, and they should already believe. But again, they're after some more. Now, I trust you're all familiar with manna. Okay, manna is the food that God provided for Israel when they were wandering around in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt. It was to provide for them. They called it manna because they didn't know what it was. That's what the word literally means. What is it? But even though they didn't know what it was, there were two things they did know about it. Maybe three things. It tasted good. <laughs> they liked it. Okay? It was something that God provided for them out of heaven. And thirdly, it was something that sustained their life. Okay, it was something that God gave them out of his mercy so they wouldn't starve in the wilderness. 
Well, the crowd asked Jesus, okay, well, Moses, he was a prophet. He provided bread for his people. We've already seen you provide bread. Provide us some more bread so that we will believe you. Maybe even give us some manna. That would be exciting. But really, all this shows again about the crowd is that they had not learned their lesson. They were still seeking the food that perishes. Remember what Jesus said in verse 26 of John chapter 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. They still wanted the things of the world. They still wanted the bread of the world. So again, Jesus, as he did on this occasion, points them in another direction. You want the manna that comes down out of heaven? Here he is. Okay. He says in verses 32 and 33, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Now Jesus, again, he is drawing from the fact that he fed the 5,000 with the, the, the loaves and so forth and the fact that they came to him again looking for bread. But now he's keen in on this image they brought up, the image of manna. What is that manna that God gave them out of heaven? Well, first of all, he points out Moses isn't really the one who gave them that manna. The Father did. And secondly, that this manna was really a picture, one that Jesus can now use and draw upon because it's in their minds, one that pointed to the true bread which the Father had now sent them out of heaven and which he was willing to give to them and to the world that they might have life. And they still didn't understand exactly what Jesus meant by this, so they said to him in verse 34, oh boy, Lord, always give us this bread. If the Father has supplied bread that, that comes down out of heaven that we can eat and live forever, give us some of this bread. I mean, doesn't this sound reminiscent of what Jesus said to the woman at the well? She offered him, you know, the, this water. Actually, he said, give me some water to drink and so forth. And um, she said, or he said to her, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you and the gift that he gives, you would ask him for water, which if one drinks, he'll never thirst again. Well, here is bread that comes down out of heaven that the Father gives. If one eats, he will live forever. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread. Now, the fact is, they still were not ready to receive this bread. They were still thinking Jesus was speaking about literal bread, but he was really speaking about himself. And to make this even clearer, following on this image of bread, Jesus says to them in verse 35, I am the bread, the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Now, you know, it's interesting. We understand that imagery. We understand what Jesus is talking about. If we didn't, when we came here, we already know because I've already said it. But they didn't understand this. When Jesus said this, they were shocked. Jesus, you are the bread that comes down out of heaven and gives life. How can that be? They had an even greater difficulty with this because they knew Jesus. They had some understanding of who Jesus was. They knew that he was born. They knew he grew up in Nazareth. They even knew something about his father and mother. He says in verses 41 and 42, Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven. They had two difficulties here. Je how could Jesus be bread? After all, he is a human being. And how could he say now that he's come down out of heaven because they knew that he was raised in Nazareth? They knew his parents. Well, Jesus is going to go on to explain how he is the bread of life and how it is he came down out of heaven. But again, we have some background information that they don't. Let's not forget that Jesus did in fact, come down from heaven. That Jesus is the eternal Son of God. That Jesus emptied himself by taking to himself our nature, human nature, being conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and he became a man so that through his obedience and through his death, he might become for us the bread of life. He might become for us the only source of life. 
for fallen for all of fallen mankind. Jesus is the bread which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now again, Jesus is using the language representatively. He's not literal bread. We don't eat of him literally, but he is the bread of life. He is the bread which one can eat. He is the bread which the Father gives. He is the bread which comes down out of heaven. And by receiving him, we can receive eternal life. And that brings us to the second point where we get into even a little bit more of the difficult language. And this is really the whole point behind what Jesus is saying. If you want to live forever, you must eat this bread. Now again, I just remind you, this is all about faith. Jesus is pointing to himself as the source of life. If you will only believe on him, if you will only trust Jesus to save you, Jesus will save you. Now again, sometimes he says this very plainly. He says in verse 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Believes what? Believes on the Son of Man, trusts in Him, receives Him as Lord and Savior. But at other times, He continues to speak in a symbolic way. In verse 48, I am the bread of life. So sometimes plainly, sometimes symbolically, but what He is aiming at is faith. You have to trust Him. You have to receive Him. Now, again, He, he, uses, this, he uses these other images of um, bread and of flesh and blood and the idea of eating because it's an image of receiving and receiving Jesus as a means of spiritual life, spiritual nourishment. Speaking of this again in terms of bread, he says to them first of all that he is better than manna. Yes, God provided manna for his children in the wilderness, bread out of heaven so that he might sustain their lives, but they ate it and they died. But here is a bread that if one eats, he won't die, but have eternal life. He says in verses 49 through 51, Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Now, we have to admit it would be a great blessing if God would provide for us bread out of heaven on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, he actually does do that for us every day because every good thing we have comes from him. But Jesus is emphasizing that he has given to you something better than physical bread because you can eat these things that God supplies us in the world. You can eat it every single day of your life, but eventually you're going to die. Same thing is true with regard to the things of the world. You can go through this world trying to get everything you can of the world, trying to get the world, as it were, to satisfy you, but at the end, it's only going to bring death. Our Lord said on one occasion, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Well, here is something that comes down from God, a bread that gives life, something that is better. If you eat of this bread, you will never die. The things of this world, the things that God provides, cannot take away sins. It cannot free you from the sentence of death. If that's all you have, if that's all that you have eaten, if that's all you continue to eat, Jesus says you're going to die. You're going to go down into hell forever, which we call, of course, the second death, judicial death. It can't save you. God has not provided salvation in these things. There is not universal salvation. But here is a bread that can take care of your needs. Here is a bread that can remove your guilt. Here is something that can cleanse you of your sins and one that can provide you with a perfect righteousness by which you can enter into heaven. If you only eat of this heavenly bread, and what Jesus means by that is if you will only come to him in faith and repentance, you will live forever. Now again, to tie this to himself in an even more powerful way and to tie this salvation to his humanity, that he is the one who gives life through the work that he was now doing as the mediator who has come into the world, Jesus ratchets up the imagery now a few notches to something that becomes even more difficult 
to understand. Instead of saying that you must eat from this bread from heaven to have life, now he says, you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Think Luther here. Verses 51 through 58. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now, I already told you, think Luther, right? It's not hard to understand why Luther believed that you literally had to eat Jesus' flesh and drink his blood and why he believed that his flesh and blood were literally in the Lord's Supper. It's not hard to understand while reading this why the Roman church believes that the bread and wine are actually transformed into the body and blood of Jesus and that you literally must eat of his flesh and drink of his blood before you can have eternal life. But again, remember, this is just an image. It's a symbol. Jesus is still talking about believing in him. I mean, think, for instance, 11, you know, 11 of the 12 disciples, at least of those apostles that were with Jesus then, already had eternal life. There were some in Israel who had already trusted in the Lord Jesus and had already received eternal life. There were those who lived centuries before Jesus Christ, going all the way back to Adam, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and had eternal life, and yet not one of them had literally eaten of his flesh or drunk of his blood. Before those days, Jesus had not yet become a man, so there was no flesh and blood. During those days, Jesus' body was still intact, so nobody was eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Today, he's in heaven. His, his humanity, the man, Christ Jesus, is in heaven, and heaven must receive him until the fullness of time when he returns. His flesh and blood is not here. When the disciples heard Jesus say this, they didn't take out two by fours and start carving on him and beating him, trying to get some of his flesh and eat some of his, you know, drink, well, drink some of his blood, eat some of his flesh, because they knew that couldn't be what Jesus meant, because that isn't what he meant. Jesus is simply saying that our salvation depends on what he did in his humanity. He came into this world as flesh and blood, as a man like us of our same nature to do what was needed, what needed to be done in order to save us. And in so doing, he, in his humanity, has become the source of life. He is spiritual bread and spiritual drink. And all who feed on him by faith will live forever. You know, what Jesus is saying is that, again, as food, as bread, nourishes our bodies and sustains us physically, we need to feed upon him spiritually. He is spiritual nourishment. And I believe that's just simply another way of saying that Jesus is the one who gives to us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the new birth, is what gives to us spiritual life. He is the one who sustains us. He is the one who strengthens us. Jesus is saying that through his his work as mediator in our nature, his flesh and blood literally have become a source of nourishment to us because it's through his humanity that he actually gains for us the Holy Spirit. But we need to look to Jesus for that Spirit. He is the one who has him to give. So basically, if you eat the bread of this world, Jesus is saying, if you go after physical bread, if that's all you're seeking, if you live for the things that are here, if you seek for the glory and the honor that comes from this world, like the children of the world, that that's all you do, then you're going to die. 
And what he means by that is not just die like everyone else dies, but you're going to experience eternal death in hell because the things of the world cannot save you. They cannot take away your sins. And if that's all you're seeking after, you're going to die. But he says, if you by faith would feed upon him, if you turn from this world, if you trust in Jesus, if you receive Jesus, if you follow him, you will live forever. And Jesus says he will raise you up on the last day. Now we know from Scripture that Jesus is going to raise all the dead on that final day. What he means by this is he will raise you to that resurrection of life. You will pass judgment. You will be received into the kingdom. And you will inherit that kingdom if you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you've eaten the world, go after the world, you're going to perish with the world. But if you receive what Jesus has to give you, if you trust in him, if you receive this bread, if you feed upon him, if you eat his flesh and drink his blood, by faith receive him, you will live and not die. And so the Lord asks you this morning, have you eaten of this bread? If you haven't received Jesus, if you haven't fed upon him, you're spiritually dead. If you die in this condition, he warns you, you will be justly condemned for your sins and you'll have to undergo eternal punishment. If that's true, you need to understand Jesus offers to you this bread this morning. He says that the bread that he gives is, is his life. It's for the world. The, the gospel invitation goes out to everyone. Jesus offers to feed you this morning if you'll simply come to him and feed upon him by faith. You do have to believe. You do have to trust. You do have to receive. You have to take him at his word. So if you will and turn from your sins and look to him to save you, he will save you and you will live forever. Now let me just again emphasize this, that the Lord says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus says if you come to him, he will satisfy you. You won't need anything else. Once you eat of this bread, once you drink of the water he has to give, you're never going to hunger and thirst again. Now sadly, this doesn't mean that you're no longer going to have any desire for the world. As long as you have sin in your soul, you're still going to have a desire for that, which is why the Lord tells you that you must continually fight against those desires. You need to put those desires to death. But what he does mean by this is that if you come to Jesus Christ, you won't continue to look for salvation anywhere else. You won't look anywhere else to satisfy your spiritual hunger. The search will be over because you've come to the only thing that can satisfy you. You've come home. You won't need anything else. I'll just remind you again of what Paul says. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in, whether I have a lot or whether I have a little, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I have Christ, if I have tasted of Him, then I won't need the things of the world anymore. I won't need anything but Him. i remind reminded again, Don and I were talking about this recently, an illustration that I read years ago about a man who heard, he was walking by this old shack of a house and he heard this noise coming from inside and so he thought he would look inside to see what it was and when he looked through the crack in the, in, in the you know, again, it was just a shack, it wasn't very nice, he looks through this hole in the wall basically and he sees a man sitting at this rickety table in a rickety chair with a cup of water and a crust of bread in front of him and he's just praising God. And he says, all this... He goes, and Christ too. He goes, I've, I've got Christ and he's given me all this. I, I'm just, I'm so overwhelmed. All this and Christ too. Christ really does satisfy. And the question is, has he satisfied you? If you're not satisfied, you haven't really come to Christ. If you're looking for Christ plus something else, he's not enough. You haven't really come to Christ because he who comes to him will never hunger. He who believes in him will never thirst. He is all we need. And if we have him, we'll be content even in the meanest circumstances. And if we have him, we'll be able to endure even the most extravagant circumstances and not have our hearts led away because those things will still be nothing 
compared to Jesus. Jesus satisfies. He is the bread that takes away hunger. He is the bread that gives eternal life. So again, Jesus is the bread of life. He's the only bread that we can eat that will fully satisfy. And if you would live forever, you must eat of Him. You must trust in Him. If you would be satisfied and stop looking around for things to satisfy your life, to fulfill your life, you have to come to Him. You have to trust Him. He's the only one that can do that. But now let me just make one more point as we close. And that is, we, we all need to understand that what Jesus is talking about here is not a one-time feeding. It's not a one-time meal. Sometimes people treat Jesus in that way. I trusted in Jesus years ago, and that's all I needed to do. And I've just been content since because I know that my salvation was secured back then. Well, you know what? If you trusted Jesus only back then and you haven't trusted him throughout the years and you're not trusting him on a daily basis and looking to him on a daily basis you never really trusted him back then because that was only the first of a series of days in which you trust him every single moment you need to continually feed upon this bread it's not a one-time meal now you have to do that if you're a Christian that's what it means to be a Christian that's the evidence that you're a believer but you also have to do that if you would be spiritually strong in the Lord. You have to continue to eat of this bread. Coming to Christ is just the beginning, just the first meal, but it's supposed to be the first of many. Jesus is to be your daily bread. You need to look to Him every day. You need to look to Him throughout the day. You need to draw strength from Him. You need to receive fresh outpourings of His Holy Spirit to be able to live the life that He calls you to live. It's to be a moment by moment walking with Jesus, trusting with Him, drawing from Him the strength you need, drawing from Him the wisdom you need from His Word so that you may make choices, decisions that honor Him in everything that you do. Now, one of the reasons we saw that Jesus sent His disciples out onto the Sea of Galilee and He, he prayed that the Father would send a storm was to teach him this very thing. This is the reason why God brings trials into our lives is because we forget to feed on him. I mean, when God turns up the heat, we suddenly realize that we don't have the strength that we need and we begin to seek after him because we haven't been continually communing with him. It drives us back to Jesus for fresh effusions of grace, for fresh strength that we might draw from him that food, that spiritual food that we need so that we'll be able to face that trial, so that we'll have the strength to live the kind of life that he calls us to live, that goes against the current of the world that is so different from the world that's going to draw the world's ire and attention as we do. So let's be encouraged by this passage this morning. If we've already tasted of Jesus Christ, if we've already fed on him by faith, that we continue to do so, that we continually to look to Jesus for His grace and eat this heavenly bread that He has to give us so that we might live for His glory. Jesus is the bread of life. We need continually to feed upon Him. Uh, let's bow in a, in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us do what He has called us to do.